Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, September 8th, 528 a.m. Central Time. Grain market's a little bit lower this morning. Matt Bennett is here. Mackenzie is here. Um, Matt, I want to start off uh, before we get into the news by asking you about price action in the soybean market, which has been very much disappointing here late in the week. We had the big ratings drop on uh, Tuesday afternoon, 5% down in the good to excellent category. So USDA very much acknowledging the fact that this hot and dry weather has had an impact yet the market can't hold and is on the decline again this morning. What do you make of this? Yeah, I think a couple of things are going on. I think it's a well-known old story that uh, the U.S. balance sheet is very tight. The thing is, is that the world balance sheet isn't tight. And I, and I got to think that world originators, they, they've been a little bit, oh, I don't know. They've been buying U.S. beans, don't get me wrong. I just think everyone knows there's a plethora of beans out there. And so I don't know that there's any urgency whatsoever to go out and chase $13.50 to $14 plus beans around. And I, I think that it's got a lot to do with the hesitancy of people to step in here and speculatively buy this bean market. So the 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 crop in, in terms of, of conditions and um, that sort of thing, I mean, it's it's deteriorated. I don't think there's a question about that. It's just no question. It's, it's a question of to what degree. And I suppose we'll find out on Tuesday. Why don't we uh, use that to jump into the report? Yep. So USDA will release its monthly crop production and WASD report on Tuesday. Ahead of the report, traders expect a reduced corn and soybean yield number compared to last month. However, many traders expect larger corn and soybean acreage numbers, um, numbers amid uh, August FSA data indicating as much. I talked about the acreage stuff, or I didn't talk about the acreage stuff yesterday when I ran that corn balance sheet. And uh, I wasn't trying to make a prediction about the corn balance sheet. A bunch of people commented in YouTube. And they said, Joe, you got to drop harvested acreage. There's going to be a lot of abandonment, corn chopped for silage, whatever. And I, I guess the reason that I don't see a huge adjustment there is because the August FSA data very clearly indicated that planted acreage may be higher than what USDA has indicated. But at the same time, if you do see uh, that abandonment or whatever, maybe it ends up being a wash at the end of the day. I don't know. Uh, what do you make of the yield numbers, Matt? Are you on board with this stuff? Yeah, I mean, our official yield, I believe, is a shade under 173. So, I mean, we we came down a little bit more than other people. I think it might have even been 172 and a half. I mean, we belabored the point forever. But I think what it boiled down to is that, you know, our carryouts weren't all that different from last month. I mean, that you and I talked about that the other day. Yeah. I've got to think that uh, yield on uh, uh, soybean is going to come down somewhat. Corn the same. I mean, the bottom line is, is that uh, over the last month, you got to make the case that the crop has either gotten bigger or gotten smaller. Now I understand it's a different methodology from August to September, but I'm really struggling to think that uh, we have a better crop uh, than a year ago based upon uh, rainfall over the last month. I think that uh, the finish was absolutely not the finish that you'd want to see. And I think that it's going to uh, be one of those things that you're going to learn more about after September 1st as well. What do you make of um, the outlier estimates that are indicating like, higher than USDA numbers, like that Informa number, which is um, uh, now the S&P survey, like they were out with a 177 and a half, I think in corn. Um, is that is that totally impossible or is that still within the realm of possibility? Yeah, I don't think it's totally impossible. I don't think anybody thought Illinois could go 214 last year as a state, you know? And so uh, the thing is, there's gonna be awfully good corn. And I've said this all summer, the timing of this rainfall couldn't have been any better for yeah. a lot of people. It's just the problem is that, uh, you know, you get into situations uh, like in Iowa, there's uh, several growers I've talked to, you know, in two different parts of the state that are telling me essentially it's, it's 50, 60, 70 under APH. And so that's early, you know, your early stuff is going to dry down the quickest, it's probably going to be some of the worst corn you get into. I understand that, but bottom line is there's some awfully challenged crops out there too. So, I don't think it's a 177 and a half crop, but I'm not going to say anything's out of the realm of possibility because we've seen crops completely outperform anything we thought they could do over the last few years in places. So anything's possible. I talked about this in the podcast yesterday and you and I talked about it in uh, our premium video this week. But um, if we get the the yield cuts, are we going to get demand cuts along with it? Is, is yeah. that the most likely scenario? I, I can't imagine anything, but, you know, as far as exports go on corn, I mean, they've got plenty of room to go down. Beans continue to catch up. I'm not so sure they'll do anything there, uh, but they're going to have to if they take yield down. They just will. I mean, that's what USDA does, especially this early. I don't expect that they will get carry out much below 200, if below 200, but, you know, maybe they will. I mean, it, it's a tough, it's a tough call, but I would, fully expect exports will go down for both corn and beans if yields go down. 
Let's jump to the weather and some of this river stuff. So forecast for the U.S. Corn Belt offer little to no rain. The Mississippi River Valley will stay mostly dry. The seven day forecast offers little to no rain for key river valley areas. The 10 day Euro and GFS model runs are dry as well. The six to 10 and eight to 14 day outlooks call for odds of below normal rainfall. Government projections indicate that river levels will continue to decline through the third week of September. So the uh, record low on the river at memphis was 10.79 feet below normal october of last year what they call your operational limit is like 12 feet below normal uh this morning we're seven and a half feet below normal but the projection is that by the 21st of the month we will be more than 10 feet below normal at memphis so by the end of the month i suppose if it doesn't rain you could very easily be back to the record lows that we saw last year in terms of the river levels at Memphis. Uh, Matt, are you seeing basis implications already or uh, what sort of impact do you see here? You know, I mean, the, the thing is the basis hasn't been as bad as you would think it would be, yeah. I guess, on the river. I mean, SIF values haven't been bad. You know, we've seen, I think, uh, just a shade under a buck over in, in uh, as far as SIF values go. So I don't know. I mean, my personal opinion is that what you're going to see is, for instance, in my part of the world right now, there's people pushing for some of that early corn, but over at the river at St. Louis, I believe they're only bidding like five over. And so uh, Decatur's bidding 20 over, you know, and that's, that's just till Saturday. If St. Louis was bidding more like a 30 over, like you'll see a lot of times this time of year, I think Decatur would be bidding more for corn because they'd have to, to get the corn that they need. And so uh, I think that it's going to have an impact moving forward, but I, I'm afraid that like your, once your early ship goes away, if the river is still in the situation, which unfortunately it probably is going to be based upon the weather forecast then i think that your interior basis could really start to look pretty pretty crummy if you if you will and i think uh, you won't really get good basis levels until later in harvest which i do think they will come back now this should have an impact on on soybeans as well as corn and, and maybe even earlier if you look at like a uh, seasonal chart of when we ship the most soybeans versus corn we actually ship more soybeans like immediately post harvest like mm -hmm. soybean shipping season starts to pick up late september and october whereas corn like our big shipping season is really starts in december january so i mean it's going to have an impact on on both sure. crops and, and cash markets all that sort of stuff um guys i don't usually do the ad read here on fridays but this video that we did with shay yesterday was so damn good that i wanted to tell you about it uh shay folk was on shay comes on he works with chris at agview solutions Talked about his 2024 marketing, also 23 uh, corn and soybean marketing. Shea really thinks outside the box. He's doing some stuff that is probably like totally mind blowing to a lot of you guys. Honestly, if you're marketing grain and you're looking for some direction, this is must watch stuff. If you're not listening to what this guy is saying, I, I think you're missing out, honestly. Uh, check out the premium deal at standardgrain.com. You know the deal, 50 bucks a month. Uh, cancel at any time. No other fee, no other obligation. Uh, check that out this morning, guys. I'll send you over the video. Let's get to the drought monitor. So drought conditions worsened across the Corn Belt this week as excessive heat and dry weather dominated the majority of the region. Drought both intensified and spread across Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri. The plains also saw hot and dry conditions. However, the level of deterioration was much less than that of the Corn Belt. So when we look at the percentage of of U.S. areas experiencing drought, corn country, 49%, soybeans, 43%, winter wheat, 46%, spring wheat, 56%, and cattle country, 44%. If you look at that really um, red area in like eastern to northeastern Iowa, that looks really bad. Yet I've heard some like anecdotal reports that crops in some of those areas could be just average, which is crazy to think or say when you look at this map, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely crazy. I mean, when we talk about all this weather stuff, there's no doubt from my vantage point, I want it to be dry. I, I, I don't want it to be so freaking dry. We're worried about combine fires. I mean, that really sucks, of course, but uh, you want it to be dry in harvest. I mean, that, that's what you want to see. But the thing that's really crazy, Joe, is that there's so much of this talk over the summertime frame you know, about El Nino setting in. And once El Nino sets in, a more uh, regular weather pattern is going to uh, occur. And basically, we're going to set ourselves up for what you would call, uh, you know, you're going to have the pump prime for 24 being a really good year. Now, I guess there's a lot of folks, you know, I'm hearing a lot of people that are very have a lot of angst of 
hey, what are we going to do going into uh, 24? Because, you know, you're going to be super dry again. I mean, it's the same stuff we were talking about a year ago, almost exactly the same discussion as far as river levels go yep. and as far as drought conditions go. Now, I will say, fortunately, like Cotton McKenzie's neck of the woods, you know, they've healed up somewhat. It seems like the droughts moved a little bit east, so to speak, but uh, definitely a lot of concern, I think, going into 24. I, I don't think that there's going to be a lack of concern until you start getting a significant amount of moisture, which I, I would think with El Nino, you get it, but I'm no weatherman. Nothing in the forecast right now. Uh, let's jump to ethanol production. U.S. ethanol production increased marginally week over week. Weekly output of 1.01 million barrels increased slightly compared to last week and was up 4.3% versus the same week last year. Ethanol stocks were pegged at 21.62 million barrels. The print was up marginally on the week, but down 8.1% compared to the same week last year. Implied gasoline demand increased 2.8% compared to last week and was up 8.5% versus the same week last year. On average, over the last four weeks, implied U.S. gasoline demand is up 1.8% versus the, versus the same period last year. People like to say that uh, I've been bad mouthing corn demand. Uh, ethanol, the ethanol production, uh, the ethanol industry is going to be uh, the beneficiary of this river situation. If basis levels get really weak, if there's not that demand on the river, um, the ethanol producer will be able to buy corn even cheaper. I'm really uh, optimistic about ethanol production. We know what a corn chart looks like. It looks terrible. Look at a chart of uh, ethanol prices. We've just been kind of like steady-ish here. Crude oil's come back up. A lot of the energies have been back up. So margins for the ethanol producer have been really, really good and will get even better as basis deteriorates uh, once we get into the the kind of gut slot of harvest here, right? Absolutely. I mean, we, we talked about this on our, our morning call with Ag Market and JSA actually yesterday. And so, you know, I mean, I, I watch this stuff, but it's interesting with some of our guys that deal directly with the ethanol plants to hear what margins have been and they've been fantastic. So you've got to expect, you know, with uh, oil doing what it's done, being able to buy corn as cheap as what you can buy yeah. it. I mean, the margins have been really good. And I, I've got to think you're going to see some awfully big weeks moving forward. Yes. Uh, you know, who knows? Maybe you'll be able to tack another 100 million bushels of uh, of demand as far as uh, corn ethanol goes this next marketing year. A lot of that will have a lot to do with, of course, once again, price direction of oil and price direction of corn. But I can see it happening. The margins um, that Reuters had calculated – were positive to the tune of it's a wide span, but anywhere from 35 cents to a dollar 15 per gallon. I mean, if we're not running at full capacity, we're going to be damn close to it given this uh, situation, I guess. For so, sure. uh, and, and your ethanol stocks are not like super high seasonally. Yeah. We're about average seasonally relative to the last five years or so. Um, so I don't know. I think this, uh, the, the ethanol portion of your demand base should be very strong. And if you were to set a record this year, get close to it, that would not be shocking to me. Uh, we had some Ukraine news. Of course we did. Last week, the UN sent Russia a set of proposals aimed at reviving the Black Sea grain deal. A few of the proposals included reconnecting a subsidiary of the Russian agricultural bank to SWIFT and creating an insurance platform. Russia dismissed the UN's effort, calling the proposals a new dose of promises. Lloyd's of London, an insurance marketplace, is in active discussions with the UN to provide insurance if a corridor is actually reopened. Lloyd's noted that their estimated loss from the Ukraine conflict was $1.74 billion. Matt, when you guys are doing your calls internally, is this even a topic anymore? Not really. I mean, it does come up. The only time, of course, that it comes up, Joe, is if uh, wheat markets uh, doing something on, to the tune of double digits, you know, or, or yeah. corn uh, following along. But as you know, I mean, a lot of this uh, rhetoric, if you will, was heavily traded whenever this whole conflict started. Uh, it's just it's deadened anymore. People are, are kind of numb to it. And so, you know, like I've said several times, I mean, you know that there's wheat in that part of the world. We know that we know Russia's got a ton of wheat to export it'll find a home at some point, but this is essentially disrupting supply flow. And I think getting all excited about it hasn't been, uh, it's probably been rewarding to some traders, but I'm assuming some of them got caught on the wrong side of it as well. Yeah. And so I don't think that uh, your volume, that's part of the reason my volume's gone way down as, as far as uh, trading these conflict uh, or stories as well. We still talk about it because I think you're in regard to the black sea, the whole situation, you're one event away from a big price move. 
Yep. It's just one event away, but that event, whatever it may be or could be, uh, has not happened yet or or recently anyways. Uh, cattle had a good day yesterday. They sure did. We actually saw some highs in both the feeder and live cattle futures yesterday. So October feeders finished the, finished the day up 240, closing at 258.75, which was an all-time high. And then October live cattle gained 95 cents, closing at 183.65, which was only second to the high that was set back in July at 184.52. Um, box beef continued to soften on Thursday. Choice ended the day at 311.66. That was down a buck 91. Select ended the day at 286.17. That was down a buck 44. All right, cattle people, we still friendly here pretty much. You know, the thing is, you're hearing Packers are screaming, but, you know, they've had their day in the sun. I think the problem is they're going to get squeezed a little bit. It's more here. than a day. Uh, you know, yeah, they've had years in the sun, if you will. Here's the thing. I mean, once again, from a number standpoint, um, you know, you could definitely make the case to move higher. I, I and, and it's a forward looking market, you know, and I, I hate to throw round numbers out of there. But I last week at Farm Progress, show, I don't know how many people came up to me and said, you think you're going to get your $200 cattle? And, I, you know, I still think it's probably going to happen. You look at April, I mean, 195. I mean, you're you're, you're banging on the door. We're, we're just outside of it. And so, you know, numbers would suggest that you could continue to stay strong. I think as so long as the economy can sustain it, I think that that's what you're going to see happen moving forward. And I think you're going to see some folks get squeezed big time. Mackenzie, what are we seeing in the cash market out west? Uh, we haven't had any cash cattle trade this week yet so far. Um, there were a few sales reported here in Nebraska around uh, 185, which would have been two dollars higher than what, than what we saw last week, but not enough sales to trend. Uh, so we're still waiting for that to kick in. Those packers hold out as long as they can. Outside markets are uh, early on Friday, guys. U.S. dollars about flat. Uh, stocks are off marginally. Bonds are up a little bit. Crude oil has been stronger, up 47 cents in the October WTI at 87.33 last trade. Everybody have a great weekend. Uh, we'll talk to you Monday.